Welcome to another episode of the Flow Track Podcast. I'm your host, Gordon Mack, and today we have a special guest, the one and only Josh Kerr, coming up to us live from his newly bought house in Albuquerque. Uh, got to watch the world championships uh, from the States. Uh, Josh, first of all, welcome to the podcast, and how are you doing? Yeah, it's an absolute pleasure. It's nice to be on a podcast uh, without David. You know, it's, it's a nice little change there. <laughs> change the scenery but no I'm, I'm very good you know we've we've been entertained over the last three days or so with some pretty some pretty great um tra indoor track and field so yeah it's uh it's nice to see to see track and field on on a main platform as well you know watch it on peacock and uh yeah i think we we got blessed with some pretty good results what is the uh what's been going on in the sit and kick sit and kick podcast world between you and your co-host pretty much on the daily dave's texting me telling me to do things and, and i'll ignore him for a little bit and and you know D D dave's such a hard worker man it's difficult because he's always ready to do something or he has all these great ideas and and i'm always at debbie downer being like oh no i don't have time or oh no i can't really be bothered doing that but you know right now we have a, a bracket challenge going on for for NCAA basketball not really down my alley but you know uh, we're just trying to you know, keep keep some interactions, and we'll have a podcast coming out soon. I'm sure. How are you doing in your in your bracket podcast? Your bracketing college. Like, how'd you, you know, pick your teams? Because New Mexico it, wasn't. It's in it, mostly so. what teams I know, uh, and I'm not a big basketball fan, so I don't sit and watch the game. So it's just mostly it's just mostly luck. But I heard that's not a bad way to do it, to be honest, because even having the knowledge is it's difficult to come out with a with a pretty solid bracket. But I think Dave's doing pretty well, so that's good to see. Yeah, the more knowledge you have in anything, you, you overthink it. I mean, it's like that in track. When I try to predict the result of a race, you try to overthink it. And you're like, oh, well, they they kind of had a bad race two weeks ago. And then all of a sudden, you're like, well, no, they're fine. They just didn't feel like trying that day. So it's really hard. Do you? I, I feel you... like that as well with um, with rounds. Like, you know, you see guys in like a semifinal or a heat, and you're like, wow, that person looks amazing. And then you're like, well, it's a whole new day. Like, it's just, you never know what's going to happen, and especially in the sport. Do you ever hear people's takes on, like, your potential based off of, you know, like, like if I were to watch you run a race and you run, like, a 151-800, I'm going to be like, uh-oh, it's not looking good for Josh. He's not in his, his best shape. But you know what you actually were doing during that 151 and that it wasn't a, an all-out 151. So there are a lot of times when you hear people react to a subpar race where you know the truth behind the, the result and you kind of like, I wish they knew that, you know, I was up late last night and I really wasn't putting all my energy into this random 1500 or 800. I feel like that happens a lot. You know, you've got all these message boards and, you know, lots of media like, oh no, like something's happened to Josh. He's run like this or like that. And, and um it is difficult sometimes to hold your tongue and be like, well, the reason for it is, you know, we were doing these hard workouts, we trained through this, or, you know, we're working towards something different, or we, you know, we're, we tried a specific tactic that day. And it's just, it's difficult if you don't have an interview straight afterwards saying and explaining what actually happened on that day, then it's difficult to say, you know, that's, you know, that's, you know, not a good representative of, of my fitness. But yeah, that happens a lot in the sport. And I think the more you're in um, the, the inner circle of that person's life, you have exactly, you know, you know exactly what's going on. But yeah, I, I think there's been a couple of times I've been on Let's Run or something like that. And uh, someone stuck up for me on like a forum post and everyone's like, hi, Josh, how's it going? Like, stop trying to back yourself up sort of thing. And like, I've never posted on there, but uh, a lot of people think that I'm like backing myself up just on my own post. So <laughs> yeah, I, I see it happening. You have your own burner account? you know just uh to... I, I mean i might have to hire someone to, to, to you know back me up in, on, the, on those accounts because you know some people are saying some mean things about me going on there and i can't really back myself up right now have you ever caught maybe it's your potential maybe it's your co-host david kind of trying to troll troll you and kind of prank you by <laughs> being your biggest hater on the internet he's quite possible? the troll but he's a lovely man i would never see him doing it you talk about you know like your situation better than other people around you obviously most all athletes know what they're going through they know their their training going into any race i do want to highlight when you rang a 348 uh how long ago is it like three or four weeks ago yeah you wrote, three weeks ago 
you wrote on your shoe that you like were predicting this time. I just okay. First of all, it worked out, right? You ran, you ran a, a great time, <laughs> and then you had the shoe, and you were able to show like a uh, new new record. Yeah. What was your plan if you didn't run that fast? So I ran three fifty two point something at Milrose. And it was like more of a race and I made a fair few mistakes. And then I had three weeks of extra training um, afterwards. And so to be honest, I really saw no other outcome. Like I, like I, I sometimes, when I have that kind of confidence where I legitimately have, I see no other outcome other than running like extremely fast, then I'm just like, you know what? Like I felt like this before and I've never let myself down. And so why not, you know, back yourself up and be real ballsy about it and have some fun. Because I knew I wasn't, you know, the, the plan was either, because we ran Spok Spokane like a week later or 10 days later or something after Milrose. And Danny was like, well, why don't we go for the, the mile record? And I was like, Danny, I don't want to just break it. I want to I wanna smash it, like this record. I don't want this to be, you know, broken like a week later. So we, we took that month and it was a really good month of training and then we went for it. And so, yeah, I, I knew that I was, I knew I was going to break it. I just didn't know by how much. And, um, but yeah, if, if I didn't break it and it said that on my shoe, it would have been really embarrassing. And so that's why it's really fun. You know, you can't yeah. back well, out. You pro the, the, the advantage you had is if you, for some reason had a side stitch and tripped up or something, whatever, um, no one's going to, no one can see what's on your shoe. Right. So you could have just quickly ran to your spike bag through the shoe inside and be like, all right, no one's all that. We'll just, we'll just keep that. that little, that's my true. little secret. I, I did tell our cameraman it our like photographer i was like you better be taking photos of this and our, that's what our assistant coach said as well because i asked him for the pen the night before and he was like okay like we're going for it now and i was like don't worry i got this and so uh, i i mean i'm personally i felt like i i sold myself short by not writing british record times two on the shoe you know that that would have been really ballsy i wasn't quite ballsy enough to do that but it's just a lot of fun and i think you know at the end of the day, we're, we're out here to entertain, you know, the, the fans and, and uh, people watching. So doing something risky in a low risk environment is something that I enjoy doing because it gets me ready for, for bigger risk events, such as World Championships, Olympics and um, British Championships and stuff. So I enjoy putting the pressure on myself, to be honest. OK, I challenge you this. I mean, this you, you speak about riskier events. How can I get you to put a Sharpie and write the word gold? on this spike in Eugene, you know, after the prelim or after the semifinal and be like, it's happening. We're gonna be, I, I'm going to be zooming in on your shoes to see if you have any predictions of your race result. That's what I'm going to be doing. That's, a, that, that's the funny thing is that now I'm like, maybe people have thought that I've written stuff on my shoes before and like, I just haven't shown them or something like that. But I mean, these are the only pair of spikes that we have because these are prototypes. And so, um, I had to speak to Brooks and I was like, hey, like I can't run in these again. So like if there's any more prototype spikes, that'd be great. Cause I don't think they come out till April and um, because I'm not racing them again. So yeah, I'll, you know, if I write gold on my spike the night before world champ final, then you know, I'm going to be real confident. So yeah, I'll, you just keep an eye on the spikes. If I don't have it down there, then the odds are it's not going to happen. There we go. So let's talk a little bit about the, the 1500 that just went down in Belgrade. First of all, you, I, got, I just got started this. Why weren't you in that race? Why, why weren't you in that, that 1500 in Belgrade? If I was, if I was to be completely honest, um, I don't hold a lot of weight on an indoor medal right now in my career, I, I, as my career currently is. I don't have a gold medal either at the Olympics or World Championships or any major championships in my, in my country. So Europeans, Commonwealths. I don't have a major gold medal. And before um, I get one of those, I'm not looking to get minor medals in my mind. Um, and so I think a, as a world indoor medal, I think that is a more of a minor medal than an outdoor. So before we, you know, we, we look at the year and we go, uh, world outdoors is our biggest goal of the year. And so what are we gonna do every, every day that makes us in the best position possible for world outdoors? And if that wasn't to fly to Belgrade and run the indoor 15, then that's not what it was because we also had to fly back for British championships. And then 
it was a lot of travel and then you know we then wouldn't have that much time to get ready for a 5k and, and take some time off so it just timing wise didn't work out that well and and I put a lot of weight on on outdoor worlds this year and you know if I'm able to get an outdoor world championship gold medal then that means a lot more than even trying to challenge for a world indoor medal and so I think a lot of people had a similar idea um as, as well as with the travel and things so yeah which made it, made it a little bit more of a weaker 1500 than it would be outdoors I would say but um it is a bit of a shame but it's just the timing of it to be honest do you feel you know some fans are always going to be like, why isn't Cole Hawker going there? Why isn't Josh Kerr? Why aren't the best, eight, all the best 400 meter runners at this meet? You know, and the fans are going to kind of say their two cents about how World Indoors isn't treated properly, you know, and that the fans want it. But then from the athlete perspective, you're like, well, I'm not incentivized to be really good at indoors. Yeah. I'm incentivized to be good in July. Um, do you think there's any way to change that incentive for you guys? Like, is there a, could you think of a solution where you would, wouldn't call world indoors minor? Yeah, I, I, I think there's a lot of monetary value as well. Like I don't think brands hold as much weight with an indoor championships as they do outdoors. So like, uh, I'm not going into deals as my own contract, but say a random contract, not norm. They don't normally have bigger indoor bonuses than they do for outdoors. And so, if, if brands were like, you know what, let's like go a bit more all in on, on an indoor championship, indoor, you know, a, an indoor US or UK title, uh, an indoor world um, title, and or even making the team, like those bonuses are just nowhere near as big as they would be for outdoors. And so, um, you know, you'll see, I think you saw, you know, Cooper and Cole going after the 5K um, um, standard for, for outdoors and stuff instead of doing uh, for coal anyway, instead of doing world indoors. And do I think that's mostly money? Maybe, maybe a bit of travel, um, but it all adds up. Uh, I think, you know, having two major championships in one year is difficult to deal with anyway, especially for people who haven't done what they think they can do at an outdoor championships right now. Yeah, just, I always just feel like our sport is trying to create something that doesn't want to be created. Like, yeah, you know, we do, we're trying to you know manufacture championships, but if we really wanted to create more moments for people like you to be incentivized, you need to you need to stop calling you know outdoors the one and only. And you, I I think the best situation was get rid of world outdoors and make it four outdoor championships and call them majors, right? The way yeah. Tiger Woods wants to win the Masters just as much as he wants to win the British Open, you know, or like Wimbledon yeah. and the Australian Open. No, that's fair. It's, it's understandable. It's just difficult um, to think like, we're, we, you know, are we doing that in one location? Are we doing it in different locations every time? Like, you know, we're, we're going all around the world in the last, you know, in the last year and this year and next year. Like it's, it's, it's difficult to, to think of all the, especially with, with the way the world is right now as well. So, you know, indoors versus outdoors versus, you know, yeah, however many majors you want to put in there. I mean, it's going to be a quick Olympic cycle again, too. So we have a lot of stuff coming thick and fast. So there's just going to be a lot of different world world uh, champions and Olympic champions coming up in the next three years. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you're going to, you said you run Commonwealth Games, which is a week after World Outdoors. Yeah. And then there's even a European Championships outdoors, you know, two weeks after that. Oh damn! So, so your summer is gonna be really hot. It's gonna be like yeah, it's. Uh, long I summer. mean, I, I, as you know, I'm not much of a racer. So, you know, I think I raced nine times last year, and and um, five of them were at major championships. I think I'm gonna be racing something stupid like eighteen or twenty times this year. So, wow. Yeah. So you're gonna double. Wow, you already figured that out. All right. Well, let's talk about the one race that you weren't in, but you probably have a good insight of what went down. Samuel Tafera of Ethiopia kind of surprised us all, beat Jakob Ingerbritsen, passed him in that final 50 meters. Kip Sang gets third. Um, Oliver Hoare, one of the US-based training athletes, gets fifth. What was your reaction when you were watching this race and kind of break down how you thought it played out? And were you surprised that Jakob wasn't able to hold off Tafera? 
So uh, when I watched it, I was, you know, obviously the camera was pretty fixed on Ingebrigtsen at the, uh, on the start line. I thought he looked really nervous. Um, and I was like, okay, like he's got a lot of weight on his shoulders right now, but he's dealt with that his whole life. Um, but he's coming in as, as the champ and, you know, you, you don't want to lose after you've become the Olympic champion. So I thought he was in good shape. He obviously ran that world record, but the way he ran it, um, which is reasonably similar to um, to the Olympics where he just wanted it fast. Um, and so he pushed it to, to make it fast early. Um, but the thing is with Tefera is he's such an odd guy where he is, in my opinion, pretty bad at rounds. Like if the race is slower and he has to kick, like he's he's kind of known to not get through rounds all that well, and then but you you stick him on a rail, uh, you know against you know you know Kachelska last year a couple of years ago, and then he gets a world record, or you stick him on the rail against an Ingebrigtsen, and where the pace is pretty pretty fast, he's one of the best in the world at that. Like putting him in a time trial, and he'll run incredibly fast. And so when I saw him having to just sit there and and knowing that he wouldn't have to kick all that all that crazy the last 200 it's not going to be a 24 25 26 second last lap i was like he's got a good shot but i don't know if that world record took too much out of ingebrigtsen but um yeah he just didn't look quite as poppy as as he has in the past i haven't watched any of the interviews afterwards if he's said something went wrong but um yeah i think it's i think it's interesting to see that um he's he's got beaten and that's going to probably make him quite angry come outdoors yeah, he was quoted saying, if I knew that I was completely shit tonight, I would have, of course, done a lot of things different, but I didn't have any factors telling me that before this race. Uh, so he basically wow. didn't know he wasn't going to be able to handle that final 50-meter uh, surge. From so he, was, he wasn't too happy then, eh? <laughs> <laughs> when, so do you think that if he would have found a way to let the pace go out in like two minutes through the opening 800, that he would have came victor based on the way you say Tafara doesn't really like these slower races. He just, because he had to take the whole thing and he was always worried about what's going on behind him as well. Like all of that just kind of amalgamated into him just doing too much of the work and worrying too much about what was going on. And, and that just ended up being a bit of a disaster for him. I think. What would you have done if you were in this race? Uh, and you see the way it goes out in the first 400 meters. What would have been your game plan once you got through halfway, where you would put yourself in position? Would you have keyed off a certain athlete? I think just sitting on Tefera would have been a smart move. Like Hoar and, and Gurley as well, they were having a tough time just getting there because they were out so hard. But if you work hard that first kind of, you know, four or 600 meters and just trying to get yourself in position, you just got to be close enough because – not being close enough is going to be your biggest problem. Do you uh, take anything? So obviously a lot of these guys you're going to see, you know, three, what, how many months away are we from World Outdoors? Four months, five months? I, I'm bad with math. But yeah, do, you like take any, yeah, do you take anything away from this race? Or do you think this is kind of anyone, it's, it really is going to have no factor on what's going to go down in Eugene. But like, do you look at this as being like, Hey, Jakob is beatable or, well, I got to watch out for Tefera in July. Like, what do you kind of take away from this? I would just say that he's just, he is beatable. He's always been beatable, but I think him knowing that he's been beaten is going to piss him off. And I think we'll make him a bit more loose, come outdoors and not worry as much about getting beaten. Um, so what I learned from it is just, we can see another way of how he's attacking a race with, you know, a bunch of a bunch of fast guys um, and being able to get through that round. But he's never had really that bad a race ever, and I don't think he had a bad race. He just got beaten out by, you know, the old world record holders. So you can't say much about that. But it's 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 a difficult it's a difficult one to analyze right now, just because you know you're, you're putting up a player who's just a bit of a bit more of a question mark as an athlete. They, um, losing kind of race. We're losing your connection a bit, Josh. If you could maybe, maybe if you go back to where you were st sitting before, connection. Yeah, right I was there. just getting a charger. Oh, okay. There you go. All right. Um, so yeah, so you're saying basically, uh oh, now Jakob's gonna be.
pissed the rest of the season and you might yeah, take it out on be real pissed. the rest of the world. Um, that's pretty cool. So uh, were you, were there, was there anything about that race in general that surprised you? Obviously people thought Jakob would win. Were you surprised with anything else behind those top two? Um, Hor finishing fifth, Gorley, Gour, your fellow countryman, finished uh, sixth. Was there any other takeaways you had? Or surprises? I think, you know, I don't think that's, I, I thought Hor would do better. Um, but again, you, you're looking at a field where, you know, Kip Sang is, is incredibly, you know, the way he ran the Olympic final last year, I think he ran the 90% of it in lane two uh, and still ended up being, you know, a very close fourth. And so I think he's a, a phenomenal athlete that hasn't quite done what he can do yet. Um, but I think Hor is like, he came in with a lot of confidence, um, but it just got strung out early and he never really got himself back into a, a position where he could kind of attack for a medal. Um, but Gurley, that's a great showing from, from Neil. Um, to be honest, like he's, he's put together a, a great performance. He's had some frustrating moments over the last couple of years with, you know, Doha not final, not going as well as he wanted to. And then he had a couple of injury problems and, and some illness problems. So him stringing together those two performances after British championships, I think is, is very inspiring to see. And it's, it's good for, for British athletics as well. Um, but, you know, I think he's, he's good enough to get up towards those medals. Um, but today, you know, again, it was a similar, him and Hor ran very similarly, um, where it was so fast at the start that, you know, it was difficult to get back up there because they were taking a bit of a breather in the middle to maybe try and have another go at it at the end. Um, but it just wasn't quite enough. Does it feel good once again to see Great Britain finishing higher than any American? Well, I mean, I didn't say it, you did. So, uh, you know, <laughs> I think <laughs> when you're going to send, um, you know, you know, second and, and was it fourth place from, from U.S. champs, it's, you know, it's, it's, a, bit, it's a bit of a shame. Um, you know, obviously my, my teammate Henry had, didn't have the standard, so he wasn't able to go. But, you know, uh, I think if I was... I think this is Prackle's first major championships. Um, yeah. So again, making the finals always, always great, and and you know that's that's great experience for another American to make another major championships and and be battling. So if he battles for, you know, making making the outdoor team, he has that little bit of experience coming forward and, and knowing what he's, his body's like coming through those rounds. But yeah, two rounds is very different to three as well. So yeah, it's uh, it's a whole different ball game indoors. So let's move over to the men's 3K. Ethiopia, first of all, Ethiopia is killing it. Not only do they get all these medals on the men's and women's side, but they have a bunch of fourth and fifth place finishes. Uh, Ethiopia goes 1-2 here. Borrega takes the victory over his teammate, Gurma. Uh, Mark Scott, good old uh, fellow countryman, gets third in this race. Um, Dylan Maggard, top of, uh, the, the lone American, was ninth. Uh, Jordy Beamish, who some people had as potential wild card based off his Milrose performance, faded to 10th. Um, what were your thoughts on Ethiopia just kind of controlling this race and dominating um, and going 1-2? They can just close so well, and they've shown that, you know, in the 15 as well as the 3K. You know, they had, what, that little bit of a slower middle K. Um, and then, they, they, you know, there was a lot of people in contention over that last 200 meters. And it comes down to, you know, who, who the kickers are. And, you know, Ethiopia have a pretty good um, standing over, over the last 200, 400 meters after, you know, even from back in the Mofara days, those guys were always the ones that, you know, kicked on to, to push him to, to the, you know, to the finish line. But again, Mark Scott's running an incredible 1500 as well. And so it just shows that the 3K is... If you're gonna run a slow second K, that is gonna be a, a kicker's race, and the guys that are good enough over 1500, um, uh, you know, like most of those Barman guys are, they do have a great close, and so you know, Marks had a had a great championships there, and and he was able to come away with, I think, his first medal. So that's pretty exciting for for British athletics. Yeah, this the race. I mean, I thought it was gonna be faster. I thought that the Ethiopian guys would be like, I don't want to mess with chaos in an indoor 3K. Let's make it low 730s, maybe even sub 730 type pace. Were you kind of sh I was shocked that it was this slow. W what was your reaction when you saw that the guys who were basically turning it into like an NCAA 3K in a way? 
looks like it's we're watching a UW 3K right now. <laughs> I know. I think, you know, we're so blessed right now as, as spectators to watch some phenomenally fast races. Um, and so, like, when they run slow, it's kind of a bit weird to see. But again, you know, for, for the Ethiopians, it makes the most sense where they're like, you know, we're probably some of the best kickers in the in the game right now. You know, obviously you've got the likes of Beamish and, and uh, you know, he's he's been good. And, and Michelle is, um, you know, has an amazing 1500 and he always able to close well. But, you know, I think, you know, two rounds in the 3K as well. Like that's that's a different ball game as well. Like, you know, most of these guys mostly run the 5K. Um, and so they know what it's like to run two rounds. But I just think the 3K is such an odd distance where it's, for, in my opinion, it's way too quick for how long it is, but it's way too long for how, like, how slow it should be. So I just don't, can't wrap my head around it. I haven't run a 3K for about 10 years. I think my PB is 8.35. So I'm not a big, uh, not a big special here, but I've ran like, I think I came through my 5K PB in like 8.0 something. So I technically could call it that. No, we're going to still keep your 3K at 835 because it's, it's a fun, yeah, that's it's fun for your 3K to be 835. You know, you're going to have to go on, go on for the rest of your career. You know, you break more British records, you get more medals. And then when you're like 45 and they look at his resume, you'll be like, wait, he ran an 835 3K? This is purposely only. <laughs> I think it was back in my school days, but yeah, that's, yeah, I might have to go and before I hang the spikes up, I might have to go and try and see if I can run a fast 3K or something. But to be honest, I just don't, I don't like the distance. I don't think it makes sense in my opinion, but that's, you know, it's just to run close to 60s for, for, you know, seven and a half laps or 15 indoors is, is pretty difficult work. But yeah, I think um, the Ethiopians have had such a great championships and they're really rolling with that. You did run cross country. So you were running some 10 Ks and your, and eight Ks in your life. Why can't we, you don't, you don't think that like, you say you don't like the 3K, but if you were forced to do it by your coach and you're forced to give an honest effort, what do you think you could run? So that's, that's always a fun question. Um, I could run in, I think I could run in the 730s. I just don't know how low 730s I could go. Um, it, this year, I'm not sure. I, like, I mean, I enjoy running the 5K. I run the 5K once a year. Um, but it's, it's yeah, it, it shows I'm there as well. Fantastic. What, what year was that? What year did I run that? Uh, 2014. 2014. Wow. 860 to, points. That's a big score. There you go. There you go. Um, so but yeah, that was, that was in my high school days. So. Yeah, 730 but, something. So there's... You know, maybe, I mean, I guess what triggers someone to, when, you, when you're when you going through high school and you're figuring out what you're good at, you know, obviously you were probably going through like more of a miler. I look at someone like Grant Fisher. Grant Fisher coming out of high school looked at himself as more of a miler. Yeah, he could do great cross country work, but I remember interviewing him freshman year at Stanford and he ran a 5K in like 1340. And he said, I'm a miler. Like I've run the 1500 and it's like kind of hilarious looking back at it. Cause now he's running 10 Ks top 10 all time in the world. How do you figure out whether or not you can become a good three K five K type guy? Because basically a lot of the best five K runners in the world, they all are 1500 meter guys in high school. You know, I think, you know, we don't really, Everyone wants to be, you know, an eight eight hundred a miler. If you're a distance guy, you don't want to you don't want to be running in the threes and fives. Like it's a lot more work, and um, especially in high school, you have to run a bit more mileage and things like that. And so, you know, being able to, you, you know, in high school you run a lot of races. And so, if if you want to run multiple races, you run the kind of shorter distances, so it's a bit easier on your body. But again, as the body develops, you kind of realize that okay, maybe I'm not as quick as some of these other 15 guys or eight guys, let's move up and see how I do with the mileage and see how my body takes it. But I do think some of the best 5K, 10K guys are milers through college. Like, you know, the, the likes of even on, on our team, like Garrett Heath, you know, knowing him, knowing that he ran the mile in college makes me laugh so hard right now. Like, and he ran it as an early pro as well. And I'm just like looking at it and I'm like, how, like, how, 
how is that possible? But he's he was so good at it, and and uh, and then he ends up being amazing at the five k, and and he's absolutely amazing at the ten k. So you know, you look at guys as they get older, and sometimes you know naturally they make that progression as high higher mileage guys, and maybe Grant Fisher just you know was able to take the mileage pretty pretty well in college without having any kind of breaking point or something like that, but. It's just dealing with injuries with with those longer distances. So starting off at the eight fifteen is is normally a good place to start, where you can get experience by running more and more races without dealing with injuries. I do know, you know, Centrowitz would kind of tease U.S. fans of be like, "I'm running a five k," and we're like, "Ooh, imagine Centrowitz and as a five k runner." Do you see a situation where you make an actual attempt to? like make a world team in a 5k like not no, this year obviously like but like having, in the next five years yeah you know i feel like we're having a real good game of chicken right now in, in uh british british 1500 meter running and um, if like we know that there's only three people that can make the team and we know that we've got seven people with the standard so people need to move like we have really we have guys that we're leaving at home that could make a world championship final and it's because people don't want to move to a different distance but it's like you know back in 2019 you know, Neil had a great championships. Jake was fifth, I was sixth. And then, so we go into 2021 and we're looking at each other like, okay, like I'm not going to move. Like, you, And then, so we've got another three or four guys coming in and I'm like, okay, so maybe James West moves to the five. Okay, no, he's not going to move. Okay, or maybe Gricey moves down to the eight or like why move? So no one wants to move. And so I'm not going to be the first one that moves, um, but I'm sure it's going to happen pretty soon. But I enjoy the 5K. But the, the thing that I can't wrap my head around quite yet is running it as a championship race. I, like I, with the two 5Ks I've ran, I think 1328 and 1323, those have been like all out really hard efforts. And so thinking that we'll have to do like pickups or like closing harder or like anything like that. I just don't have the experience of that with a 5K now, but I can see it definitely. I, I mean, I really enjoy the 5K. I think it's a really hard challenge. And I, I train mostly like a 5K guy. Um, so running the 5K is not that much different in training. Um, but yeah, not quite yet. But I, I do see it coming up in the future, yeah. Yeah, coming up in the future. So 2025? Give me, give me maybe, yeah. After the Olympics in 24, I'll, I'll, yeah. probably, I'll probably make some decisions from there. All right, I'm going to hold you to that. I'm going to follow up. I'm going to put that on my... Google okay. Calendar. I like it. Text Josh. Hey, when's the 5K coming? That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> uh, one other distance event uh, that uh, went down on the women's side, 800. Ajay Wilson, American, gets her first gold. Ajay Wilson kind of has a unique story. She was amazing as like a teenager, 17, 18 years old, goes pro, doesn't go to college. Um, she was kind of one of the first, not one of the first, but – kind of under the radar going pro early athlete and she kind of just been misconsistent all for like 10 years now um and she finally got her first gold medal um running 159 over you know good field ghoul was in that field um now obviously keely hodgkinson's hodgkinson uh did not start due to an injury um but josh what's your reaction when you see an athlete like ajay wilson be in the game for so long, ne make multiple finals, win a couple medals here and there, but just never have, you know, that gold medal moment. What can you, how can you relate to someone to, you, you know what it takes to be in the game this long, but not, you haven't been in that long yet. You've only been in a few years, but when you see someone after like a decade of running, finally get gold, what's your reaction to seeing them get kind of have that moment? Yeah, it's, it's an amazing story. And, and you know, Ajay had such a great um, U.S. championships as well. She looked so strong. And, you know, the U.S. Uh, 800 meter running is uh, for, for on the women's side is, is extra, extremely strong. And so, you know, when you've been in, in the sport this long and you've been to that many championships, like you do have a step up on the field, like you obviously don't get a head start, but you know how to handle yourself. Um, and so her, what she's probably done is she's she's accumulated all this experience and she's just... The, the stars have aligned a little bit, I'm sure, with training and, and, and mentality. And she's going, you know what? Like, this one is the one. And, and um, 
it's so difficult to be, you know, a world champion, Olympic champion. And, you know, it's everything has to go right. And, you know, there's all these my, like minute points of percentage of, of things that can go wrong. And, you know, it, it, as small as like you not tying your spike lace uh, as tightly as it needs to be the, the moment before you go out and race. And so we deal with those moments coming up to, to a, a major championships. And that's why I think most coaches have big stress problems um, coming up. It's just the most random things can go wrong. And I'm sure she's just taken everything she has over the last 10 years or so and uh, and just thrown it at this championships. And she's come out, she's come out absolutely clutch and, and come out with her first um, world championship gold medal. So yeah, it's, it's very inspiring to know that you can just go in and, and just smash it and, and know that after all this time, you're still you're still able to be at the top of your game. Yeah, it's kind of unique the way typical a typical athlete, right? There's that moment when you don't know how good you actually can be. And then you make your first championship team and you're just happy to be there. And then you're like, you're fighting for a medal. There's like stages of like, you're happy to be there. Uh, then you're fighting for a medal. And then once you kind of have that taste, you, you want to have your first gold. And people go through that phase at different moments in their career. Where would you say you are right now? Obviously, you had the I'm just happy to be there moment. You have your breakout years at New Mexico. Now you got your first medal. Are you in the stage of like, I'm, I'm not trying to chase medals. I'm chasing gold medals. Yeah, there's because you risk a lot when you're running these championships as well. And so it's not as easy as saying, you know, let's go in and, and see what we can get. You know, I'm fighting for a medal. It's very different to go and you know, I'm going in this and I'm going to go and win this race. Uh, it's a very different mentality and it, and there's a lot more risk involved for that kind of latter idea where you're like, it's it's win or, or bust. And I haven't been in a position at major championships where I'm saying it's win or bust up until this moment in my career where I'm saying the biggest thing that I've taken from um, all my experience of running is that it takes some time to familiarize yourself with the, with, you know, with your situation of a major championship, if that's like an under 20s or an under 23s or college or you know high school, whatever it is, it takes a little bit of time to get used to that situation. So now being a part where it's like anyone in the world um, can come out and you know show off how, how fit and how good they are. It's now about, I've had those moments where I'm familiarized myself and back in 2017, um, you know, I had a, a, a tough championships at home world championships in 2019. I was like, you know what, you know, this has come together quite well. I think, I think I can actually go out and medal. And then this one, you know, my goal was to medal, but I could have ran that a lot riskier and come out with fifth or sixth or a gold or silver medal. You just don't really know. And so now I'm just coming towards and I'm saying, you know what, it's uh, progress is key. So silver or gold right now. And, you know, as much as that sounds reasonably negative to go, you know, we're going for silver or gold instead of saying gold or, or bust. It's just I'm looking for progress every year. And if that means it's a silver medal, then I've got to walk away with that championships happy. And uh, I have this rule of mine, which is if I get introduced on a start line by something that's more than a year old, then I've, I've, I've failed my mission of, of my progress. And so, you know, this year I'm going to get introduced as an Olympic bronze medalist. But next year I better be getting introduced as a world silver or world gold medalist. So um that's that's kind of the way i look at things and it's it's difficult to do because the again you've got to be at the top of your game for you know four or five years to be able to keep that progress going but yeah i think it's coming together quite nicely that's cool were there was there any other um events at the meet that kind of got you excited or kind of turned your eye i know there was that moment where a fellow british athlete he had to deal with a tiebreaker in the men's 60 prelims did you see that no, I didn't. No. So, I'll, so uh, David King, Great Britain, he and yeah. Japanese athlete Nomoto, they both ran 757, which was actually 756.5, and yeah. in different prelims, but they only one person could make the final because there wasn't enough lanes. So they had to do a drawing out of a hat. Uh, you can see here them doing the official drawing. How would you react? If you knew your fate of making a final was coming down to a name being drawn out of a hat. And luckily here in this situation, uh, King got selected. But how would you feel? I I mean, to be honest, like if that was really happening, 
and that was the solution of like getting in or get not getting in. I've got it. I've yeah. I'm not sure the emotions. I probably would have walked away being like, I'm not fucking. Like I'm not going on a fifty-fifty right now. It's not going to happen. Um, I I just wouldn't have to take that. Act. But the thing is, we don't we don't deal with lanes like they do. You know, obviously, in the yeah. sixty hurdles, you can't exactly share a lane. Um, so that's that's just the crazy situation. I think they've got to be another solution than to pull a bib from the bag. That's just ridiculous. Yeah, I guess it doesn't happen often enough to feel the need to make a solution because the ultimate solution yeah. would be develop to- better timing technology that goes to the 10,000th of a second, right? It's because, you know, there technically is no such thing as a, a true tie, right? There's always a mo- like a millis, you know, a dillisecond between two people, right? So I guess that's the ultimate they, solution. Could they go back to the uh, reaction time or something? Maybe do something about like when the person actually started. There you instead go. Instead of from the gun time. Yeah, use a reaction know. time Just as a tiebreaker. I like that. Reaction time as a tiebreaker. You know? Yeah. It's like like in cross country, they like whoever has the best sixth man, you know, wins a tiebreaker. Yeah. You know, or something like that. So I like that. I do also think the ultimate way to solve it is always prepare for a tie and basically always have a ninth lane on any track. Including Yeah, I think so. Then, I think that's gotta be it's gotta be a solution. Yeah, we just need to build a ninth lane. Yeah, you can see here they could have put a ninth lane. Look, there's room. Get a little yeah, they got extra space way. there. Just paint they some lanes on there. They could have manufactured a ninth lane. Just move everyone out to the right a little bit, and then just have someone run in Easy. the red. That'll be fun. Get a little masking <laughs> tape, a little uh, trainer's tape. Set it up. They should do that. That would be It'd funny. Be I mean, they could have split the final into two or something. Maybe I don't know. Yeah, there's definitely other options. But bag from a hat doesn't seem right. I don't know. I just don't. I agree with you. That would be the worst thing ever. Uh, but yeah. I think I think if they had the choice that they would, you know, instead of letting one of them in, let neither of them in, and they can both race themselves uh, as a separate final or something. I don't know. But that's, I mean, that's tough. That yeah, sucks. It is. <laughs> it sucks. Uh, want to leave you with this, I guess. So... I'm just going to tell you, I'm in agreement with you. So I'm, this is not me uh, attacking you. So I'm on, I'm on your side when it comes to this take. But, you know, U.S. distance running is very different from international distance running, especially when you see people like yourself, people like Justin Knight, Oliver Hoare, you know, people who trained in the, who trained in the U.S. but aren't representing USA – you called out a few a few months ago. Uh, called distance runners in the U.S. are soft. Why, why do you say that? And care to elaborate on the softness of U.S. distance running? So what I will say, as a a kind of editing of that, U.S. fifteen hundred meter running is kind of where I was more aiming at. I think okay. you know you're good over the eight. And you're good over the five. I'm not going to say anything bad about that. But as the 15, there's something going on with, with 15 right now where it's like, if you take Hawker and, um, you know, Cooper out of it, where, you know, they were in college last year, it was just like everyone was looking around and no one was really running that fast. It's like no one really needed to run all that fast. It's like, you know, in the UK, we had, you know, I think we had seven people with a standard. So everyone was like, all right, like, I don't, it used to be a situation where it's like, if you ran the standard in the UK, you'd probably just make, you'd probably make the team because you're much better than everyone else. Everyone else was run 38, 39. If you ran 36, 35, you're probably going to make a team. But in, in the US, it's now going back to that where it's like, you know, people are only running like 37 or 36, maybe. Uh, and that's just in, in, in the grand turn, like grand scheme of 1500 meter running in the world right now, it's just not quick enough. Like if you're not in the low thirties, you're not going to be challenging for medals. And so you take a bunch of college kids coming out of college. It's like the pros finally woke up and, you know, ended up being, you know, a great, uh, us championships. And you guys, you know, ended up sending a, a solid team that ended up having some problems with it when it arrived. But, um, 
you know, anyone who's going to make a U.S. Uh, team is good enough to make a, a world championship or an Olympic final, in my opinion, uh, especially in this distance. But they're just not running all that quick. And it's like it's like they're having the attitude of, you know, we don't need to. So why why would we? You know, I don't know. Why do yeah, like, I mean, I think a big factor from it is the two. I, I use the, the word goat kind of leniently, but the two greats for men's 1500 meter running in the US was Centro and before Centro was Leo Manzano. And neither of those guys are known for, you know, every day going out and running an all out 1500. You know, they were really good tactical kickers. You know, Leo was one of the greatest tactical kickers. I mean, every year you're like, this is the end of Leo. And then he's like, nope, I'm gonna be top three. And Centro's, you know, you know doing the same thing now for the past seven-ish years. I think that's a big factor is that the role models or the the top dogs in the U.S. for men, they're not. They're they're saying if you want to be good, you know, don't run fast. Whereas for your your country, what you're probably the top dog right now. You need you're you're running fast, so they're gonna be like, well, if Josh is doing it, I better do it. You know, I think the main problem comes down to the top dog in Centro and Leo. Before that, they. They were just not, you know, promoting running fast. That would that that makes sense. I think, yeah, that that's true. Um, because you you do aspire to be those top those top dogs, and if the people before you haven't been, you know, those front running like all or nothing, let's put it on the line kind of guys, then that's you know, the thing is with Central Central's probably the best tactician I've ever seen over the fifteen hundred, and so he just didn't need to really do much. Um, and he did run a bunch of extremely, you know, he, I don't think he's even gone under 330. Um, but with all the medals he has, it's like, what a great career. Um, however, yeah, you're now looking at a bunch of guys that are, yeah, slightly scared to push it from the front because you, you are a bit more vulnerable out there and, and it is difficult to make that decision sometimes, but um, someone needs to do it. And uh, if someone doesn't do it in the US, uh, anytime soon, then you're gonna you're gonna continue with the same problems, which is maybe one person makes the final for 1500 meter running right now, um, and and you know that's just not enough um, for the odds of you guys to medal. And for us, like we've put we've put three people in the last two major championship finals, so so we've had six people in the last two major finals, and we have one medal. And you guys have put one person, I think, one or or three people all together, I think, all to, uh, for. Doha and, and Tokyo and you've come out with with zero medals and so it's just a it's just a stats game yeah I mean again I'm, I'm on your side as a someone from America I think the U.S. 1500 meter runners for some reason they just no one has the balls to like try and it's it's really f- interesting you what at one point I was like oh maybe it's the NCAA system I was like Josh came in the NCAA. Oliver came in the NCAA. Like there, there's people who go through the NCAA and then they go out and then run fast, right? So it's not the NCAA. Yeah. Well, I think it's just thinking it's you know, like you said, they're soft. <laughs> well, the th- the thing is as well, and and you'll see this with Ollie um, a lot more than me, but if you're an international coming into the NCAA, it's not always like the 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 best decision for if you want to make teams and so coming over to a different country to be in their college system you've got to stand out like you have to be the man to start making teams in your own country all i don't think has ever been to an australian championships but he keeps making these teams and the reason for it is he makes these races and he shows off how fit he is he has to do that on a, on a daily basis when it comes to races and i'm sure justin knight's the same and you know i'm the same as well where it's like if I'm out here where I'm not, you know, under the nose of the British selectors constantly, I have to make a scene. I have to be that guy that's like, okay, that guy's good enough to, to make, you know, make our British team to go on and, and medal. Um, and so we have to prove ourselves um, a lot uh, over here. So if we want to stay over here, we have to continue to push the boundaries. And that's kind of a big reason that we do it as well. Has any American try to defend themselves against your, your criticism? A, a lot of American high schoolers message me saying, you know, we're the best. Um, and that's that's really fun because I think I messaged one back before and I was like, oh, really? Like, explain to me why that is. And, and I think he came back to me. He was like, oh, my God, I can't believe that you messaged me back. I'm so sorry. You're right. 
Um, so it was quite funny. But yeah, no, and this is the this is the thing is I have teammates that are American 1500 meter runners, and uh, you know they are getting much better at, at you know what they're doing. And, and I think Henry ran a really good championships indoors as well. And you know Isaac's going to come through this year really well, and 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 will lead as well. We have a really good. 1500 and one of our guys will make the world championship team this year I, I you know i will say that because i i bring the same attitude to practice as i do to race day and and you know our our team is becoming a lot more ruthless you saw it with isaiah you know he ran a, a really good u.s championships he ran a really good first round um in, in belgrade as well and we're just we, we need to be more of a team that um is just taking a bit more risks um and that's how you that's how you get the results that you're looking for. It's just being a bit more risky and uh, and putting things out there. But you know, I think Henry's put himself in a really good position to make the outdoor world team this year. So who's making the outdoor world team for the men in the U.S. fifteen hundred? Get three three spots. So three spots. you only give me an order. You only give me an order. Just gotta give me the three. Okay, um, this is tough for me. Um, is Central retired or was he doing that? I don't think he's retired. You can never count him still... out. Yeah, you have to choose to retire him or not. It's on you. I thought I retired him last year and he proved me wrong. After he ran a 150-800, I was like, he's done. And then he got second <laughs> at the trials. So you can retire him if you want, but or you know, retire at your own uh, expense. This is tough because you, got, you have a lot of guys that are good like similarly good and what I say about good is probably 32 or 35, 34 ish. And so yeah. I'm putting Henry in there cause I think he can make the team uh, because you know, he was close last year. Um, but I think he's, you know, he did well indoors. And so I think he's, he's coming together to, to make the team this year. I think Cole will make the team just cause he can close. And then to be honest, it's between, uh, this is tough. This is, I would say it's between the goose and angles again, but I would put, I'd put angles in there. Cole angles and, uh, and Henry. Okay. Angles, Hawker and, and Henry. So no Centro. You heard it here first. No Josh Centro. Kerr, no Centro making on his home track. I think Centro might make a track. 5K team. Oh, oh, you're putting him in the 5K. Okay. All right. Yeah. Well, I, I want to, I want to nice him a little bit is of, uh, of what he's done but you know when you don't know what someone's doing and they haven't done anything indoors and your team's racing constantly it probably means that you're injured or you're doing something wrong so yeah he, he, his last race was back in november where he ran the uh road 5k so, also what are your thoughts on centro's instagram game look at his very you know thematic shots of his back like what are your thoughts on that <sighs> You know, I, I don't know if I, I think I might follow him. Um, again, I can't judge anyone's Instagram game myself. I just, I just like to uh, take shots at US, US 1500 meter running and just, just make some bold statements, to be honest. Well, maybe on this, uh, on your next shoe that you write, you guys write like, won't lose to an American this year or something like that, you know. <laughs> well, that's the thing is like, I look, I would love, for American 50 on meter running to get better. It would make my life a lot easier. It means I wouldn't have to travel as much to go out and run different races. But if I have to keep pacing these guys for 1500 meters and try and be their rabbit, then I'm gonna have to start getting paid by some of these boys. Fair enough, fair enough. Uh, well, Josh, I do appreciate you t taking the time to join me on this podcast, uh, reacting to some of those uh, world championship races. Best of luck. This outdoor season, when, can, when, when are we going to see Lace Up again? When's the next race for you? I think start of May, I'll run a 5K. And if that, I think that's going to be US-based, so probably a sound running meet or something like that. Um, so, you know, Jesse has been putting on some pretty phenomenal meets, so we'll probably head there for a 5K. Cool. Well, best of luck. Good luck with the new house, uh, dealing with all that stuff. I'm sure there's probably a leaky pipe somewhere you got to get to. So uh, good luck <laughs> with that. And uh, we'll see you on the outdoor track, man. I appreciate it. Fantastic. Thanks, Thanks, going. So we're going to stay here. Are we still, we're still alive. Okay. We're still alive. Um, guys, there was more thing. First of all, Josh, thanks again for coming on reacting to some of those distance races, but guys, there was more that went down. We had world records 
and I'm going to recap it all. So if you're still with us on the pod, listening, stay listening. If you're in the YouTube chat, stay chatting. Uh, we're going to break down the rest of these meets. So talked about the, the three distance events, but the main event that I want to talk about first right now, obviously, is that men's 60 hurdles. We talked a little bit about that weird bag draw. First of all, what are we doing here? Why are we sep- deciding who gets to go to a final via pulling from a bag? You know, I did see reports that the athletes were cool with it, but at the end, no, they weren't. They were, they did not, they were not cool with their fate being drawn to a woman pulling her name out of the bag. Uh, and then the story, though, wasn't really that. The real story was Grant Holloway. My boy, living up to the phrase, prelim time is PR time. Mr. Grant Holloway gets it done in the 60 hurdles, in the prelim, or I guess the semifinal, the second round, runs, ties his world record, a 729. And, you know, once again, he did the similar out in the, at the U.S. trials where he ran a phenomenal uh, mark in the, se- in, the, in the semis, and then came back in a slower mark, but won easily. And that's exactly what happened here. Runs his world record, 729. Comes back, runs 739 in the final. Easy win, though. It was just a formality. He has now won, I think, 50, 60 hurdle races in a row. The last time he's lost was in high school. It's insane what he's doing in the 60 hurdles. I think eventually, well, it's 57 is the total number. He's won 50. Seven hurdle races, including prelims, in a row. He's now tied his world record, 729. He's now won multiple titles. It is so, they need to rename the 60 hurdles to the Grant Holloways. You know, we're performing the men's Grant Holloways. That's what it needs to be. The, the men's Grant Holloways needs to be official. They need to rename it. They do that, you know. And I'm not even talking about the men's 60 hurdles presented by Grant Holloway. I'm talking about you're just, what, what event do you do? I do the Grant Holloway, which is a 60 hurdle. That's what needs to happen because the guy running phenomenal, wins easily, world record, just incredible performance for Grant Holloway. Uh, Pascal Frenchman gets second, 750. Jared Eaton, 753. American getting a medal. Very cool there. Uh, but it was all a Holloway show. Um, I did think watching this race, I was thinking, oh, I wish Trey Cunningham was in this race because I don't think Trey would have beaten Grant because Grant basically just ran to his competition. But remember, Trey Cunningham ran 738 last week. So a time that was faster than what Holloway ran in the final. Now, again, Holloway would have won. He would have ran faster. But I'm pretty sure if Trey Cunningham was in this race, he gets second. And it would have been pretty cool to have a one-two finish for Americans. So we're going to have to wait for Cunningham on the outdoor scene. But yeah, Holloway, what else can you say about it? I've, we've been talking about this guy for like years. You know, ever since he came on, came to Florida as a true freshman, kind of dominating the, the circuit there and then going over to the pro scene for Adidas and, you know, having a little bit of a, a hiccup his first year in and now it's been smooth sailing and, at the end of the day, he still has other hiccups, right? He got, um, he, he lost the Olympic final. So that's going to be a chip he's going to have on his shoulder for the next, you know, three years until he can redeem it in Paris in 2024. So he's going to just keep cruising. He's going to keep on attacking. He is not going to let up one bit for at least another, two, two more years. And we're just going to be able to sit back and watch it. No one is going to challenge him. Uh, it's going to take, weird upsets like what happened at the olympic in tokyo for him to lose and uh, i'm excited to see what happens i like it when he gets challenged i think trey cunningham is going to add a new dynamic on the u.s side devin allen is a little bit better in the in the 110s as well so throw him in there um and i'm excited to see grant holloway on the u.s circuit uh this season got a message here from uh from francis charles first of all he's a member what up? Thanks for uh, chiming in. Does Gordon count Holloway tying his world record as a world record performance? Yes, it's a world record. You don't need to break a world record. It's to Tying world records are world records. So, yes, it counts as a world record performance. Um, 
Before we get into the, the next event, I do want to tell my producer, I don't see Travis's screen anymore, uh, Colt. So if you can reset the, the setup so I can see everything, because I just see myself. So anyway, uh, so yeah, that's Grant Holloway. Moving on, we'll talk a little bit about the, the four by fours. Uh, USA men don't qualify. Very disappointing. Uh, they probably could have qualified if Isaiah Harris doesn't pull his hamstring. Runs 48 seconds. Kind of a bummer for Donovan Brazier, right? You know, he he's thinking, I'm going to go out there and get myself a, a 4 by 4 gold. Runs, you know, a solid prelim time of 46 seconds. Uh, it's the second leg. Uh, but, you know, bad luck happens, and he's not able to go to the finals. Spain ultimately um, gets in out of that heat. And uh, Belgium, the Belgian men. With only one Borley, qualify. Uh, but yeah, you see this photo here of Harris hurting his, uh, looks, maybe it's not his hamstring, it looks like it's his quad maybe. Um, not able to get the team across. I'm sure he's disappointed. He probably was looking forward to, hey, yeah, you need me in a 4 by 4 leg? Sure, I'll get in a medal. And um, it just doesn't go as planned. So very frustrating there for Team USA. But, you know, it's weird. It's weird. You, we're so used to seeing men's four by fours on the u.s side just like rack up medal after medal and just to not see it, it's kind of it's it's disappointing um but yeah at when when we did get to the final though uh belgium was victorious and they had one borley which is you know you always if belgium is in it they're gonna have at least one borley it was kevin borley they win it um pretty easily over spain and netherlands um but not much fanfare really in that event um, moving on, we did have some world records. Obviously, we had the Grant Holloway world record, but in the women's triple jump, Rojas broke the world record in the triple jump. Uh, she is the queen of the triple jump. Very impressive. Uh, and there's not much really you can add to that, right? It's, you know, she's, she's found ways to outdo herself. And I think she ran, she jumped 1574, okay? 1574, we're now getting closer and closer to like elite men's marks. If she's, she just keeps going this at this trajectory, I think there is potentially a situation where she jumps over 16 meters. I know that sounds crazy, but I just feel like there is that opportunity that she jumps over 16 meters in this triple jump. Uh, she saved the, the world record for the last jump. Uh, so she kind of had a little bit of drama there. There was no drama whether or not she would win or lose. But the drama whether or not she could break a world record was there. And she got in the final jump. Uh, and I think, yeah, I think 16 meters is potentially in the running for her in maybe in the next two to three years. And... Um, so yeah, you look at the all-time marks. Look at this. It's just Rojas, Rojas, Rojas. She beat her world record by like 0.3 meters. It's insane. Rojas, the goat of women's triple jumping. And speaking of goats, we have a goat. All right. We are living in the early, early, early days of goatim. Go, go, goatim? Go. I'm trying to make up a word. His name is Mono Duplantis, okay? And he he's like 22 now. How old is Mondo? Mondo is not that old, right? I don't even think he's 23 yet. How old is Mondo? Let's look up his uh, Mono Duplantis. He is 22 years old. So he's not even 23. He can't rent a car in the U.S. And he breaks the world record again which is now a good number, it's 6.20. You know, it's not 619, 618, 620. He clears it in his last attempt. He won the competition at 605. He won the competition at 605. And then he's like, all right, take me 15 centimeters more and then I'm gonna go for the world record. So he jumped from 605 to 620. Um, he, his only misses, were his first two attempts at the world record, okay? 
The only time he missed in the competition was when he was trying to break the world record. It's insane. The guy is the epitome of perfection in the pole vault, breaks his own world record again. Incredible. 620. The next best guy jumped 595. He beat 25 centimeters. How, how many? 25 centimeters is what? 25 centimeters to inches. Nine inches. That's like he beat basically the entire field by a subway foot long. Like a vertical subway foot long was his vic margin of victory over the second best pole vaulter in the world. It's utterly ridiculous how good Mono Duplantis is doing what he's doing. He's doing it at age 22. At this trajectory, he's going to be relevant for at least, he's going to be good till like at least 29, right? 30? 30 when he'll start slowing down? So we have six more years. These marks are just going to go crazier and crazier. He now has 617 indoors, 618 indoors, 19 indoors, 20 indoors. He's going to get 21. He's going to get 22. He's going to get 20. It's, it's insane. Um, Mono Duplantis, man. He's back to, uh, so 2022, he broke the world record twice. In 2020, he broke it twice. So that means in 2024, he's going to break it twice. In 2026, he's going to break it twice. Uh, there's so much you can say about Duplantis. He's similar to Grant Holloway with the 60-meter uh, hurdles. We need to start calling the pole vault the, the Duplant or something like that. The men's Duplant. It's, it's a bad idea, but you, you get, get, the perf get the idea. But he's pretty much turning Sergey Bupka into an unknown with the way Duplantis is going at the young age. It's only going to get better. He's only going to go higher. It's pretty cool for Mono Duplantis. And with that world record, there were officially three world records that went down. So if you picked three plus as total world records, you got that right in the Pick'em contest. And I looked at all my picks in the Pick'em. So these were the questions that we had in the Pick'em. Oh, I'll bring up. Where's my list? So uh, the ones that went down, will Mondo break the world record or tie it? That was a yes. Will Ajay Wilson medal? That was a yes. That was a strong yes. Inger Britson's margin of victory, that was an obvious NA. He lost. Uh, Grant Holloway break the world record. That was a yes. Total world, world records at World Indoor Champs, it was three plus. And the total medals for Team USA um, turned out to be... Uh, 18, so 16 to 19. So looking at all the picks, there was 11 total picks. I went five and six. So not too bad. Could be better. But I had five correct ones and six wrong ones. So that means if you went uh, six and five or better, you're going to be in the running to win the, uh, the gift card, the volleyball set, and other stuff. It's going to be great. We can do more of these picks, but yeah, that was the results of our um, pick them contest. We had Team USA, 19 total medals, um, three gold, seven silver, nine bronze. Pretty damn impressive. And weirdly though, they're not going to be ranked number one in the medal table because they have one less gold than Ethiopia, but 19 medals. It's pretty damn good. And they also had a bunch of fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth place finishers. Um, USA, I think, had a very strong day. They had an A, a week, in my opinion, um, especially when you look at the field that they sent. We know, not all the best athletes went. I mean, we did have some obviously great ones like Holloway, Coleman, Krauser was there. But, you know, there's some people who are sitting at home like Fred Curley, Sidney McLaughlin, Dalila Muhammad, uh, some of the you know, Grant Fishers and all those guys. They were all sitting home. But the people who showed up, they did a pretty damn good job. 19 medals. Um, very impressive. I think, you know, they're probably, a lot of these people got third and second are probably thinking I could have gotten gold. I'm sure someone like Krauser is thinking, what if? Someone like Christian Coleman is thinking, what if? You know, maybe this the gold medal count could have gone a little bit higher. Um, but overall, good day for USA. And Ethiopia, low key, the best distance country in the world. Uh, nine medals, all in the distance events. Um, they could have, they could have gotten even more medals. They almost, there was four distance events. So they, the max amount of 
they they had three people. Did they have three people in every event? No, I think they only had those events that only had two. Let's assume two, four, ten. I think I, I could be wrong. I think they had three in almost every event. So if they had three in every event, three times four is twelve. The most medals they could have gotten was twelve, and they got nine. <laughs> it's pretty damn good. So uh, Ethiopia getting the job done on the distance side. United States getting the, the job done on the track and field side. And I think this is a good sign that USA is never not going to win the new team trophy that they're going to give out at world championships, whoever scores the most points, because I don't see a country really touching USA's when you combine men and women, it's not even going to be close. Um, but yeah, that's the, my thoughts on the medal count. Let's keep going down the list though of other events that went down um, and stay tuned. Cause I do have, Something interesting that I kind of want to get off my chest. My colleague, uh, Travis Miller, sent this to me, and I think it's pretty, pretty interesting. Uh, but first, quick recap. Um, men's high jump, Wu of Korea won in 234. Tembiri, the Olympic champion, finished third. Women's long jump, Serbia's Vuleta uh, in her hometown won. Uh, USA went 4-5. And then the women's 4x4, four four, I believe... Who won in the women's four by four? And I, I, I was interviewing um, Josh when the four by four was going on. Jamaica, so Jamaica wins. That's kind of surprising because USA finished outside the medal. When's the last time Team USA doesn't win a medal in either the men's or women's four by four? It's kind of wild. Um, Jamaica, we're gonna hear that. So Jamaica now they they. They got their their star sprinters and you know Shelly Ann and Elaine Thompson hurrah. And now they're winning four by fours. Team USA to get get a star put getting their shit together because if Jamaica starts taking over the four hundreds, what what's gonna happen next? You know. Uh but Jamaica wins it with Bromfeld, Russell, McGregor, and Stephanie Ann McPherson on the anchor. They win it um in 328-40. USA finishing back and forth. Now, obviously, USA, there's no a thing, Mo. There's no Sydney. There's no Delilah. There's no Allison Felix. I could go on and on and on. USA clearly would win this if we tried. Uh, but, you know, we didn't try, so Jamaica gets it. So congrats to that. And um, looking forward to USA showing up with their big guns uh, come outdoor season. Um, fastest split was, I think, Femke Bolt. And 50-26. Where was that in the final, Femke? Going up against um, Shawnee Milowevo. I don't know. Anyway. Okay. So I'm going to end this podcast with something interesting that um, crossed, my, crossed the news desk from my, my colleague. Okay. So you guys remember the men's 60. It was basically a virtual tie. They both met uh, Jacobs and Coleman ran 641. And according to the official results, uh, Jacobs beat Coleman by 0. 0.003. So they both, they're, both their times rounded to 641. But when you go to the 1,000th one, the 1, of a decimal, Jacobs got the win by 0. 0.003. And if you remember, when the race happened, there was like a long delay. There was like a two, three minute delay to find out who actually won when you go to the 1,000th of a second. And ultimately it was Jacobs who was deemed victorious. So this is where we gotta get a little controversial, okay? So whenever they do timing, they have this, this weird photo timing that kind of shows where the lean is and there's a line to show when they cross the line. And at first you look at this, clearly it was close between uh, Jacobs and Coleman. Coleman is uh, in the red, so he's behind um, Jacobs in the foreground. He's in the background, Jacobs is in the foreground. Now you look at this line, they are so close, right? Look at those two lines, right? They clearly, that's, that's clearly showing that it was a close race. But when you look at these lines, I don't know about you, but the second place line looks like it matches up with Jacobs. 
And the first place line looks like it matches up with Coleman. Now, Jacobs is the one who won, all right? But when we look at these lines, it looks like Jacobs' line should be for Coleman and Coleman's line should be for Jacobs. So let's zoom in. Can we zoom in? We're going to do it. We're going to zoom like hell. Okay. So the, this is a picture of Coleman, okay? This is the, the line on the right. That, that's supposed to be Jacobs' winning time. But that line matches up with Coleman. It matches up with his shoulder, which is, the, which is connected to his chest. Your shoulder is connected to your chest. And you look at the line that Jacobs is supposed to have. Show this. There is separation. You see, you see daylight between his jersey and that black line. Now, I'm not saying they made a mistake, but does this picture potentially prove that Coleman actually won the, the, uh, the indoor 60-meter title? There is clearly space here between the Jacobs line and his chest. You see that blue, the blue dots, right? And there is, there is air there, man. There is air. The lines seem kind of a little iffy. There's questionable. When you look at it, it looks like the front line is for Coleman. The second line is for Jacobs. But for some reason, they gave Jacobs the front line and Coleman the second line. Now, I'm not accusing any, you know, Fugazi or shadiness or going, anything going on. I think, you know, the timers, I don't think they're doing anything illegal or anything like that. And I think I'm not trying to diminish Jacobs' mark. Regardless, they both ran 641. Who cares? Who came down to 0 .003. It's luck when it comes down to that. So it doesn't even matter who got first or second in, in, in the, at the end of the day. But that... There's a, I think potentially there was a mistake there and that potentially Coleman should be the gold medalist and Jacobs should be the silver medalist. Um, Jacobs post-race said, when you win two gold medals, you cannot win by chance. I think those two lines, it might be a little bit of a chance there though. Like there's a little bit of a chance when you zoom in on the lines, there's a chance that that line that they gave to Lamont Jacobs is incorrect it should have been shoved back a few pixels and the line that for coleman should be shoved forward to where jacobs's line is because look it lines up perfectly now i know we're trying to look at pixels right now and you know pixels can be misleading and all that stuff you can't maybe use it in the court of law but what i'm saying though is if you look at this i think team usa tf I think Christian Coleman's team needs to take a look at this screenshot and think, hey, Mr. Timer, we may need to take a second look, have a second opinion here. Now, they're obviously not going to change the results, protest periods over, all that stuff. And again, I'm more than willing to recognize that Jacobs beat Coleman straight up. He ran 641. It doesn't matter. Like, and I'm willing to look at Jacobs as a legitimate favorite going into outdoors. Like, he is my favorite. But the lines just tell a different story, okay? The lines tell a different story. And when you zoom in on the lines, there is a situation where Coleman's front chest is actually the winning line and not the, the back line. It looks like they, they freaking estimate because they gave Coleman that line on the, the second line. They gave Coleman the second line. It looks like they're just trying to like x-ray through his shoulder and assume that his chest is like at that spot and they don't there is clearly air between between uh jacobs's line i'm telling you though controversy what are your takes here i guess let us know in the comments i'm sure the the chat might be going wild right now i'm not looking at the chat but I think we have a little bit of some photographic evidence that there might have been a mistake in the men's 60. And uh, just take a look at it, you know? Just take a look. Uh, see, uh, we see people in the comments now. Uh, Coleman won that. Coleman definitely won that, but it's all well and good. People are so quick to write someone off after one race, he'll be back. Coleman won that race. 
Yeah, I, I think Coleman might have won the race. But I also believe that Lamont Jacobs is a real deal. So I think Coleman won the race, and I think Jacobs is the real deal. That's what I think. That is my reaction. Coleman won the race. Jacobs is the real deal. And I think, I think we can go, go to bed at night with those two thoughts and not feel too crazy about it. But yeah, look at the photographic evidence, ladies and gentlemen. The timers might have made a mistake. Now, I'm sure there might be a, some timer out there who's like, Gordon, you're reading it wrong. You're supposed to look at the photo in a different way, flip it upside down, turn it sideways, zoom in at a different angle. Uh, and clearly, uh, Coleman lost the race. But I don't know. I just feel like they probably shouldn't have released that photo because that photo seems like it's damning evidence that Coleman won the race. Anyway, let me know your thoughts. That's the pod. Thanks for listening. Uh, we'll be back live on Tuesday. Kevin will be back. Uh, we'll be, we're gonna, I think we're going to do Tuesday, Thursday next week. Um, and then we'll be back to our regular Monday, Wednesday, Friday schedule uh, reacting to outdoor season, man. I think uh, it's crazy. Outdoors. It's already here. Indoors is over. Time for outdoors. Thanks for listening. Thanks to Travis and Colt for producing over the weekend. And we'll see you guys on 